All right, I'm going to be speaking today about, so I have finished the sermon series um, last week about new life. It was what God put on my heart about creating new life because he, God is in this season right now of bringing forth new life. And we plowed through uh, six, six or seven weeks um, of what, how does it look like when God creates new life? Um, and what does it mean for us to join him in that? What are the challenges? And, but now I want to shift gears a little bit, and it actually ties together very nicely with new life. There is something that the Lord put on my heart for uh, direction of the church in general, and something that I have just really seen over this last couple months, where I feel like, you know, the, the, Lord, the Lord is doing a new thing. He is creating, for sure, new life, and um, it's somehow about discipleship. The Lord wants to do discipleship. The Lord wants to... Can you imagine Jesus walked this earth 2,000 years ago? And the one ministry that he really did, apart from preaching and healing people and ministering, was actually discipling people. It was discipling people. And how often do you hear uh, sermons preached about authentic discipleship? You count them on one hand, right? Like, well, why is discipleship somehow such a seldom commodity when, when, when it comes to, to church disciplines? And this last two months, I tell you, um, have been challenging. I, I have, during this time period of, of coronavirus, I realized how, how fragile we are in our faith somehow. Um, we, have, we were not able to meet here on a Sunday, and uh, people all over the place. I, I've, I've talked with many people. Jen and I, we called uh, pretty much everybody through, everybody that we felt like needs to have a phone call right now. And so we call a lot of people through, and we always felt the same things, like, ah, people are torn apart right now. It's, it's a really difficult situation. Many people were laid off um, their place in life right now. Everything is shaken somehow. All the issues, all the underlying issues that families sometimes have, sometimes you don't notice it because the husband goes to work in the morning, uh, the mom stays home with the children, and then they come home and they connect a little bit. But sometimes, or, or she's going working and there's financial struggles, but very often life is a busy, you don't even notice the issues, right? But then when there's a shutdown and there's a stay-at-home order, hallelujah, all those issues come out, right? All those issues come out. There was a lot of, there was a lot of that. There was a lot of uh, struggling marriages. There was a lot of uh, personal faith uh, that was really stretched during this time. And with all the phone calls that I had, with every single phone call, literally, I was sitting in my office, and I felt like uh, the Holy Spirit nudging on my heart, if they would be in a group right now, close-knit together in a group right now with other people, they would not feel that way. Did you ever wonder why those underground churches in, in China or in Iran or something, why they grow and flourish so much? They cannot meet. They're persecuted. They're being persecuted, and yet they grow. There is, this, there is something about coming together in small units where you can really minister to one another. Do you know that my, what my job is? To equip the saints. Who is a saint in this room? All of you. All You can all, all lift your hands. To equip the saints for the works of ministry. Amen? That's my job. To, to create a system and to create a platform somehow to, to make the church a place where you guys, where each and every one of us is equipped to do the works of the ministry. What is the works of the ministry? We're being the ambassadors for Christ. We're being the aroma of Christ. We're going out there and the Lord wants to use us wherever we're at. And what we're, we're here getting ready, this is like this training ground. This is, but it also it, it means that all this personal stuff needs to come out. We have to deal with everything. You know, I realized this last two months that in our Western society, much of our spiritual well-being, very much of our spiritual well-being is dependent on accessibility somehow. You know, we, we live in a, in a country where you have a lot of fast food, let's, let's admit it, right? You have a lot of fast food. There is, everything is really accessible. If you want to just research something, I mean, I have a library in my office with books that I thought I need, 
And every time I prepare a sermon, I'm like, ah, oh, where is this? The, the, there was a passage. What's that concept again? Instead of walking over to my library and going deep with the books, the deep books that I have, I open up my smartphone, I go online, and I punch in the question, and it gives me everything digested already. It's just all there already. I, all I have to do is to write it down. Um, sometimes I have very often I actually have to verify it because it's, there's a lot of stuff out there, right? But I just thought, you know, I, much of our spiritual well-being in Western culture is determined by a, our accessibility, accessibility to our Bibles. What would you do without Bible? What would you do if, the, if you were ever restricted from meeting together in the church, like forever? What would you ever, like, would, would you fall apart? W w would you die? Like, just, I was asking myself those questions, like, man, if I would have to live without the Bible, without any seeing of your beautiful faces again for months and maybe years, how would I do personally? I mean, the last two months, that was quite a stretch, but what, what about, like, for a longer period of time? What is it? What, 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 like, what, what, what is that? What, what, where is my personal faith? And is that the right system for us as church? And I was in this time period, I was reading, uh, I'm plowing through seven books right now at, at the same time. And um, that's why I'm well, all over the place sometimes a little bit. But, you know, and I talked to a couple of pastors already, and I had a, a conference call with the discipleship pastor of Emmanuel Christian Center. His name is Andrew, Pastor Andrew. He's the discipleship pastor there. It was a fantastic talk. And he talked it up like awesome, like what, what they're doing with life groups and with small groups and how their system works and everything. And I was like, this is awesome. Tell me more about it. But the more he talked, the more I, I, I realized he's actually fitting discipleship like every other church in, into a, into a ministry-minded church system and model and then really struggling um, cause, but we'll talk about this probably next week or in two weeks from now. There is a difference between doing ministry, like a ministry-minded model, and doing a discipleship model. There is a, a very big difference, and we don't even realize that. You know, there is a big difference between just being a believer versus being a disciple. Do you know that? There is a huge difference. There is almost a world of a difference. It's almost the difference between receiving and investing. As, as a believer, all we do is, is believe and come on a Sunday to church uh, because church is accessible for us. And so we come and we receive. Um, this like, but if we cannot stay on this level. The Lord is urging us. We got to go deeper. We got to grow more in our life. And the key word is discipleship. It's not what we receive anymore, but we actually start investing our life. We actually take our own life and we start investing in our own life and looking at our own life. Where are we at? Where is my mind at? Where is my heart at? What are all my underlying issues? What am I doing every day on the phone? What am I doing every day watching on TV? Uh, confronting myself. I'm, I'm like investing in my, my own self. But as I do that, it starts transforming our own personalities. And how many of us are willing for transformation? And this is, this is the thing about Western society. We all want <laughs> we all want help, but nobody wants to change. You know, it's one of the things, I, I'm a, a counselor too. I had a profession once as a, as a counselor, and I still do counseling. And one of the things I realized fast is there is many people that want help, that come to you for help. But when it comes to the point of change, <laughs> that was the last time you saw them, you know? Why is it so hard for us to change? Um, the sermon today, I wanted to title The Cost of Discipleship. And I just want to talk about this a little bit. What is the cost of discipleship? And I, I really just preach from one passage here uh, this morning, and that's from Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, the verses 16 and on, onward. We have here a unique story about um, a young guy or a, a young man who is interested in what the Lord has to say. He comes to the Lord and he asks him a lot of questions. Um, and then the way that the Lord answers, it shows you where the heart is and where the issue really is. So let, let's just plow through that one. It starts in verse 16 where it says, And behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, uh, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? 
Now, what, what, do, you, do you notice something about that question? Something, somebody comes to Jesus, who is the healer, who is the savior. He is, he is the uh, announced king. He is, he is coming. And there's a guy coming to Jesus and says, what good deed must I do in order to be saved? But what, what does that show us? It's, like, it, it's almost like this religious feeling about like, uh, what... Um, you know, in the Roman religion, uh, religio, um, the, 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 the Latin word, it means to, uh, to connect with God. But it was a, very, it was a systematized way of believing. Uh, you are not so much believing in the person, but you're much more adhering to a system. And then by adhering the system, you are a part of what you believe. And there is, there is a, a, a fine difference there. He says, teacher, what deed must I, must I do in order to he- go to heaven? Like, what, what do I have to do? Just tell me. What do I have to do to get to heaven? And then and he says to him, um, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one. So all of a sudden, he doesn't talk about a deed. He talks about a person. Do you see that? Uh, what, there is only one who is good. And if you, have, if you would have eternal life, keep the commandments so all of a sudden he doesn't talk about what you have to do because if jesus would have t- told the guy exactly what to do it was like all right let's just do this let's just get done with it and this is my ticket to heaven right but it's not like that jesus turns the question it's like it's not about what you do it's about whom you know and whom you believe it's like knowing the person you got to know the person uh, in order to inherit eternal life uh, there is only one who is good. He turns it back to God and he says, you got to uh, obey the commandments. And then uh, the, the rich young man, he says, which one? Oh, that sounds good to me. Wh- which one? Just, just tell me which one. I'm, I'm going to go out and fix it. I'm going to do it, right? Which one is it? And Jesus said, well, you should not murder. You should not commit adultery. You should not steal. Stealing is bad. Uh, you should not bear any false witness on your father and mother. Ooh, that's a hard one, right? Uh, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, sometimes hard too, but you got to do that, right? And then the young man, he says, all these I've kept, I'm like, awesome, that's my checklist. This is all on my checklist, did that, done that, that's it, I, I got it all. It's like, this is all good. I think this is my ticket to heaven, this is all good. And then the young man says, all these I have kept. But then he asks another question, he says, what do I still lack? It's like, Yes, he knows that he has done all those deeds. He has done all the things. And yet there is a feeling inside of him that tells him it's still not quite a thing because there's no assurance of salvation. You can have the most religious, devout person doing what is right all the time. And you ask them, do you know that you go to heaven? And that person might answer you, well, I hope so. I have done a lot of this and I've done that. I've done a lot. But there's, not this, there's a missing this assurance of salvation that knowing that I know that I know that I know. That I'm living and breathing by the Holy Spirit. And if I close my eyes for the last time, I'm opening them up in heaven. That assurance is somewhat not there because everything is, is your own doing. And it's this um, salvation by work somehow. And so uh, do you see this in this text here? about what this young, rich young man is uh, struggling with. He asks him another question. It's like, this is not it. It's like, there's still something missing. What do I still lack? And then Jesus says to him, all of a sudden he turns. This whole discussion turns. And he says, if you would be perfect, go and sell what you possess and give it to the poor that you may have a treasure in heaven and then come and follow me. Come and follow me. Hmm. If you want to have internal life, Jesus says, yeah, do all this stuff that you might have treasure in heaven, but what you've got to do is sacrifice your own life. We use sometimes the language of picking up our own cross. What does it mean to pick up our own cross and follow Jesus Christ in a true disciple heart? Come and follow me. And then listen how the the young man reacts in verse 22. And when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possession. Isn't that great possession at this point, like this millstone around his neck? It's like, man, this is just this iron ball on his leg and just can't move forward. Like he's coming to Jesus all excited. Teacher, 
What do I have to do in order to go to heaven, in order to be saved? Uh, what do I have to do? And Jesus says, well, you got to know the person, right? You got to know the person, keep the commandments, but then sell everything. It's like, give up your life and follow me. And it's from this point onward where the decisive factor between being a believer, because he believes in the teacher, he believes in Jesus, and being a disciple. Those, that's where the road goes apart. You can be a believer in Jesus. You can be a believer in God. Uh, other religions believe in God. Even Satanists believe in God. <laughs> Everybody uh, might believe in God, but that has nothing to do with following Jesus Christ, with having Jesus Christ in our heart um, by the power of His Spirit for our inner man to become alive again and to follow the voice of the Lord, to sacrifice this life, to leave the junk behind, even to leave the treasures behind and to follow Jesus on the quest for, Lord, what do you want out of my life? All I have is maybe, what, what is it, 20, 30, 40, 50 years left? What do you want out of this life? I want to spend eternity with you. That's all right. Whom else do you want to take with you? Want me, whom else do you want me to bring with me when I stand before your throne? You know, it's, it's one thing to appear before the judgment seat of Christ, before Jesus in heaven. And I'm like, I made it! I made it, hallelujah, the angels are singing, everything's nice, I get to dance on those clouds, and it's going to be all great, and Jesus looking at you and saying, where, where's everybody that I gave you, that I led across your path? Where are all those people? Why, why did you come alone? Why did you come alone? That, that's the, like, wow, I, I guess I should have thought more in my life maybe i should have maybe i missed something along the road that's that difference between just believing in god and coming on a sunday to 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 to, to church and receiving and going home again and maybe by sunday three o'clock already forgetting what what all of this is about and then um, just waiting to come back for next sunday to get a new refill of that cup and is, but that's not what the Lord wanted from us. The Lord wanted from us an authentic relationship that we know the person, Jesus Christ, that he is the resurrected Jesus Christ. Um, at the funeral, it just keeps coming back at the funeral. I was preaching actually a fishing sermon about the resurrected Jesus Christ, how, how the disciples had to know the resurrected Jesus Christ and how Peter threw himself in the sea to swim to the shore because he knew the voice of the master and he was just uh, swimming to Jesus. We have to know the person. It's not in the things that we do. It's all up to God. We, we, all we ever leave behind is a legacy of obedience in, this, in those small things, step for step for step at the time to walk in the things that the Lord has for us. The Lord will not ask us in heaven, tell me everything that you have accomplished in life. He's going to ask, have you done the thing that I asked you to do? That's all that counts. And it, it requires every single time a sacrifice on our part and every single time a leap of faith because it's going to be a stretch. And But we step in faith and we start walking in faith. It, it's so sad just to hear that, that a, a, a young man, um, seemingly he has everything. He has wealth, he has rich. He, he, I'm sure he was... Benevolent. If he's already interested in the kingdom of God, if he wants to go to heaven, I'm sure when he, whenever he got opportunity for alms giving, he was doing that. He was helping people. He was giving alms. He was doing everything that he possibly can. When he says, I have done all of this stuff. Um, he has lived by those Ten Commandments. He, he has done all this stuff. And it's just still something else that I'm lacking. But you've got to know the person, and you've got to follow me. You've got to pick up that cross, and you've got to follow me. There's something so strange in those words. And yet it is so vital and so important. The difference between simply believing and being a disciple is the ability and the willingness to change. I want you to hear that again because when, when, when the disciple said, when, when he hears the words, follow me, he has to sell all of his possession. What else is it but requiring change in his life? Everything that he ever knew, he has to abandon, to leave behind, to sell, give it to the poor uh, so that they receive a blessing out of it too. And, but everything changes. 
We, in, in our Western culture, we live so much in, in, a, in a mentality that uh, we are receivers. We, we come on a Sunday, we receive, and we, we, come and, uh, we, we come in prayer and we receive. But how often do we come to the house of the Lord? How often do we come to God with soft hearts like, Lord, change me. Lord, change me. Only, very often, only when we're at the end of a rope, right? i tell you one thing. Um, <laughs> Sorry if I say this now. I gave Jesse a clue that when I talk about this, that he, should, he can come up already because I wanted to mention it toward the end. But I want to say this already. So you don't have to come up and play worship already, all right? But I have seen a lot of true and authentic discipleship in our Celebrate Recovery program. Very much, very much so, where I feel like almost sometimes other studies that we can do, they're not even quite as close as what I see in Celebrate Recovery. Because in Celebrate Recovery, people come ready for change. They know that they have come to the end of their rope. They come sometimes broken, and it's like, man, this is my last job. It's like, I, I got to change. I got to change. Um, the the self-denial does not work anymore. I need a higher power. I need Jesus Christ. I need change in my life. And then sitting in that round and saying, guys, I blew it. I let me tell you all about it. And just letting it all out, being this soft, being willing to change and adapt to what the Lord has for somebody's life. That is what discipleship is all about. It's not like going to a movie theater and watching a movie, being entertained by it and going home again. Are you still with me? You still love me? <laughs> Good. It's this ability and this willingness to, tra- to change. We know one thing, and many of us uh, know that, the more we want of the Lord, the closer you get to the Lord, the more somehow you sometimes feel you have to leave behind from your old life. You know, it's interesting. In the baptism, we have here a baptism pool, if I step on here. So this is a baptism pool, okay? And in the baptism, we symbolize that we are dead to our own life, to our old life, and that we are resurrected to the newness of life, right? That's what we symbolize. We make this decision at one point in our life, but then the rest of the life that we live, it's literally still trying to die, Sometimes we don't want to give up those old habits, those old ways of doing things. And we still, it's like we make the decision, we make the public declaration that we want to leave the old behind. We want to live the new life. We want this change. We want this transformation. And yet it's too easy to walk right back into our old life and without changing. It's a lifelong discipline to change those things, to kill the old life, to pick up the cross, to follow Jesus Christ. And like, Lord, what do you want for out of this life? You would have maybe 30, 40, 25 years. Maybe sometimes it's only a week, right? Sometimes we know it's only months. Somebody has cancer. Who knows? You know, but then to ask that question, like, Lord, what do you want to get out of my life? I'm going to be in heaven with you, but... Is there something that I can do for you, regardless of my own? What is this, this 80 years that we live uh, here compared to eternity? Eternity. Uh, we can't even think about it. It's like it has no end, right? It's this endless long thing. When I tell my kids to be patient, they always say, it's like, this is forever. This is eternal. <laughs> like, you have no idea what eternity is. It's, it just doesn't end. You know, it has, it's outside of time. We all we need to be disciples, and we, we all need to be willing to adapt to that and to follow Jesus Christ. And to follow Jesus Christ is costly. It costs us, first of all, it costs us our old life because we are changing from our old life. Then in the new life that we have, we still have to change constantly, leave the old uh, stuff behind we in the ever-growing intimacy with the Lord and changing of our habits. And in the end, it even costs us our new life because then we're going to transition into the e- eternal life. And we leave everything like uh, Christianity, authentic discipleship is, is always lived in sacrifice, sacrificing their own life, dying to yourself and living for the Lord. Amen? Amen. I mean, when you think about we we admire huge heroes like Smith Wigglesworth. Oh my goodness, what this guy did. Catherine Kuhlman, Billy Graham, he has passed away. Reinhard Bonke, he has passed away. Ravi Zachariah, 
passed away. Heroes of the faith. Voices that have led millions to the Lord altogether. The uh, huge heroes of the faith. You can ask each one of those names. Did you ever have to sacrifice anything in your life? <laughs> They're going to laugh and smile like, oh, all of life is sacrifice. All of life is sacrifice. And we are not accustomed somehow to this life of sacrifice because of the culture in which we live. And it's almost like also about how we do church. And, like, and I try to think about what it is. And there is no other that has ever described this, this concept better in which we live than Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I said his name correctly. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his... Do you have this book? Cost of Discipleship. Discipleship, the older version was the cost of discipleship. And he has laid this out amazingly. He has talked about a concept that he has actually shaped. He called it cheap grace. Cheap grace versus costly grace. Yeah, did, did you ever hear about that? Let me tell you this. Cheap grace is the mortal enemy of the church. Cheap grace means grace, bargain, basement, goods, and cut rate forgiveness, and cut rate comfort, and cut rate sacrament, almost like you go to a grocery market, and you know, there's, there's deals, you know, you can have deals, uh, like Jesus driving out in, in the temple, all the tax collectors, and the money changers, like you can get a deal for your salvation, it's all deals, right, it is grace without a price, and grace without cost, cheap grace, it means that grace is a doctrine, and as principle, as a system, it means forgiveness of sins as a general truth. It's like God is this big teddy bear in heaven. He forgives everyone. He would not send anybody to hell, right? It means God's love is merely a Christian idea of God. He says, I just highlighted here a couple of word, uh, uh, sentences. The world finds in this church a cheap cover-up for its sins, for which it shows no remorse and from which it has even less desire to be set free. Think about that for a second. Because grace alone does everything. God's grace, God's love is just uh, plentiful, and it, His grace does everything. Everything can stay its old way. Isn't that true? The Christian should go along with this world and everything that we hear in the world and not venture to live a different life under the grace uh, that um, under under this grace, and the Christian should live like the rest of the world. Where we we are being uh, told that like, well, why are you so different? Just you know, th this is acceptable. Society accepts it basically, and that the Christian, um, the Christian has to let grace truly be grace enough so that the world does not lose faith in the cheap grace. He says, so the Christian, so the Christian needs to follow Christ. Since the Christian is, so the Christian need not follow Christ, since the Christian is comforted by grace alone. That is cheap grace. That cheap grace is a justification of sin. Hold that thought. Cheap grace is the justification of sin. Grace, cheap grace, is the grace which we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without repentance, baptism without the discipline of community, the Lord's Supper without the confession of sin. Cheap grace is the grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without the living and incarnate Jesus Christ. Um, versus all that stands the costly grace of God. The costly grace is the hidden treasure in the field for the sake of which people go and sell with joy, <laughs> not bickering about it, but with joy, everything that they have for the sake of which you tear out your own eye if it causes you to stumble. It is costly, but it calls to discipleship. It is grace but it, because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs people their lives. And it is grace because it thereby makes them live. It is costly because it condemns sin. It is grace because it justifies the sinner. Listen to this. Cheap grace justifies the sin. Costly grace justifies not the sin, but the sinner. There is a difference. And then it says, um, and it is 
Above all, grace is costly because it was costly to God, because it costed God the life of God's Son. You were bought with a price, it says, and because nothing can be cheap to us if it is costly to God. Wow. Yeah, isn't that something? And it's like, and, and just, just this different, and this is what I was talking about. This is the norm in which we somehow find ourselves, this society in, in which we live. We, we talk about this cheap grace. I remember that um, when Jane and I, when we were out there, um, we, we, we got, oh, yeah, Riverside Church. Yeah, that's a really cool church. Say, before we come to your church, um, uh, let me tell you, what's your standpoint on homosexuality? What's your standpoint on yoga? What's your standpoint? And it's like, before I want to join you, I want to make sure that you have the right doctrine, you know, which is, of course, the people's doctrine, right? And it's like, it's almost like this, this weird thing. It's like, do you remember in the 80s when the punks came to church? And everybody, and there was this whole thing out there about uh, they, they, they need to come in, we need to love them as they are, and we are not supposed to change them uh, because they felt like that. It has almost swapped, this pendulum has swung in the other direction where people are telling the churches and us as Christians what we ought to believe and that we cannot be so strict about our beliefs. I got a, uh, somebody wanted to join our church, and uh, be, before he wanted to join the church, he, he wrote me a long letter and he said, I, uh, can you explain to me what your standpoint is on this and this issue? And almost like a long list and, and a little bit of explanation. I was like, man, uh, I, I, I did not answer any of that. In the end, I said, well, how about you just come and see for yourself the atmosphere of God and God in person? Um, never got an answer back. <laughs> so I, I'm sorry if I lost... Uh, 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 potential church member on that but you know it, it just shows this this strange consumerism somehow of our faith a consumerism about just going to church and just receiving and just getting it fast you know everything is fast everything is instant let's just go and let's do our thing and then let's go go home about it again, again in our own way when god calls us uh, to a faith that is that needs to be moldable in his hands a faith where god wants to be not just an object in the corner but where he wants to be a lord over our life did you ever realize that the kingdom of god is talked about in terms of a monarchy it did you ever realize it's not a democracy <laughs> let's vote on that Oh, hold on a second, God. Let's majority vote. If the majority is for it, you, you can do that. We can do that. It's not like that. It's because his standard is so much high. His ways are so much higher than our ways. Our ways are not his ways. His ways are not our ways. Isaiah says that very clearly. The Lord, he, his standard is high. He's a holy God. He is a God worthy of glory and praise and worthy of worship. What governor, what, what president is worthy of worship? Our God is worthy of worship. He is holy and he is in eternity forever and ever. And one day we will see him. And for us to like, oh, okay, let's just bargain about this deal. You know, that, that's not it. We serve a holy God and it is us that has to change. Us that needs to have a, a, a moldable heart somehow for God. It's like, God, I gladly, I gladly just leave everything behind. Just ask of it. I leave it behind. I want to pick up my cross. I want to follow you. And then whatever you want to do with the rest of my life. That is what discipleship talks about. So today I just wanted to introduce then because I feel like come fall, I, I just, I just, we need discipleship in the church. And we have done it in the past too, through here and there, bits and pieces. But it was never really a coherent system of discipleship. And it doesn't mean that somebody is the teacher and somebody is the listener who, the, who doesn't know anything. It means that we're all, I need discipleship. I'm the lead pastor. I need discipleship, right? What does discipleship mean? But losing the baggage of life. And ever walking on this journey of more of God, walking more toward God and abandoning more of my heart to God and allowing God to flow through me on a daily basis. My devotion life, my prayer life, the way that I talk with my spouse, the way that I talk with my children, the way that I talk with my neighbors. God wants to change everything. He will constantly wants to improve our lives and leave us for, for His glory because He wants to save lives. 
And one day I want to stand in front of God's throne and say, ah, thank you, Lord, that you brought all these people with me. <laughs> That's awesome. Awesome. Thank you that you allowed me to be a part of your kingdom, of this fruit-bearing movement, that I was not this dead stick that you had to pass away, but fruit-bearing movement. Amen. This is a huge challenge. So we're going to be talking about this next coming weeks about it. And I, I feel like this is something that God put on my heart, but not just for me. I believe this is for us as church because God wants to prepare us not only for our personal lives, but for what's coming too. Because who knows, who knows when the next, whatever the next virus is called, but they come every four years, right? I've heard. You know, whatever the next virus is, whatever a persecution is, wh whatever happens, the church of God is the church of God. It's the kingdom of God, and the, 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 the kingdom cannot be shaken. The yeah. gates cannot be overcome, right? That is the Lord. It, we are standing on a firm foundation, and we are having this, this building block. Jesus is the cornerstone. The whole building of the church in our life, everything is built on the most solid foundation that was ever laid in the history of humankind. We have salvation in Jesus Christ, and we get to be a part of the biggest movement of God's kingdom. Amen. Let's, let's move in that direction. Are you on board? Sounds good. Let's stand up.